What was lesson number one? The rich don't work for their money. Yeah, the rich don't work for their money. What do they do? They make their money work for them. That's right. They make their money work for them. And then last night we talked about something that's essential. What's essential? Giving. 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 Yeah, giving is essential. And so understanding the fact that giving is essential, Kiyosaki comes right back and he gives us the second lesson. And the second lesson is what? Financial literacy. Yeah. But why is it so important for us to be literate in finances? You have to understand what you're trying to accomplish and yeah. know how to manipulate it. And I don't, yeah, a lot of times the reason why many people can't do well with finances is because they never learn. They never learn the numbers. Amen. We read the words all the time, yes. but we never translate them into numbers. I remember, um, I don't know if it was one of my students in, um, in the, my Sunday school class or if it was one of my students in my international Bible study class with um, Bible study fellowship that said I never understood why I had to take all these math classes <laughs> until I got my first job. And then I got my first job and realized they take money out of my money before I get my money. Right, yeah. right. And then when I found out they had already taken my money, I got mad because I didn't learn the numbers in school. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to school so I could learn the numbers to find out if they were taking out the right amount of money. And then I went back to school to determine I'm not going to let them take out that much money. I'm going to let them take out only this much money. Do you all know we can do that? Mm -hmm. We don't have to let them take out all of the taxes that are being taken out of our checks. Mm -hmm. What we can do is we can redesign our structure so that before Uncle Sam takes his, I've already given myself my payment all right. through your what? Your 401k. And we talked about that on yesterday. You got the flex plan, the, the flexible spending plan is another way. And so tonight we want to look at principle number three. And principle number three is... Everybody has a paper tonight. What is principle number three? Wisdom. 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 That one is a simple one, right? Mm -hmm. right. No, that's <laughs> not always use wisdom. Right. You can always it use wisdom. That's so simple. simple. Yeah. So, Ida, will you read that one to us real quick? <clears throat> principle number three, wisdom. We are to be wise beyond our money. We are to save and invest money, but not hoard it. We are to spend money but with the discretion and control. We are to give back to the Lord joyfully and sacrificially. We are to use our money to help others, but with the discernment and the guidance of God's spirit. It was not wrong to be rich, but it is wrong to love money. It's not wrong to be poor, but it is wrong to waste money on trivial things. The Bible's consistent message on managing money is to be wise. Proverbs 1, verse 5. <laughs> oh, my bad. Was that supposed to no, no, no. Oh, okay. That was just me. It's not for me. <laughs> Proverbs 1, verse 5. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. So God wants us to be wise yes. in our stewardship. Yes. Once the Lord blesses us with health, strength, right mind, he turns around and blesses us so that we can go out and earn Amen. that income. And now that we've earned the income, we want to attribute it to what he's already done for us, strengthen us, kept us, you know, provided for us, uh, encouraged us along the way. Because someone, is this hard getting up? To that, that, to that job. <laughs> Not knowing if the work that you're doing is being appreciated. Right. Sometimes it's challenging. We do get discouraged. But when we look back at what God is doing right. in our lives, we have to thank him because we know that if it had not been right. for the Lord on our side, the question still stands, where would we be? Amen. Amen. So we do have to ask that. So looking at Proverbs 1, thinking about the fact that a wise man, he will hear and increase what? Learning. He'll increase learning. Who just said that? Yes. I was about to yes. shout out of yes. my shoes. I said, hold, so hold down yes. just a minute. That's right. Because I kept hearing the word yes. obey. Yes. Obey. Yes. Obey. 
And I think he gave some Greek terms. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, hoop boss. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or cool. <laughs> yeah, and I was thinking, you know, when I hear it, but do I obey it? Right. And, and not, he's not saying that. Those were not Reverend Alexander's words. Those were Jesus' words mm -hmm. in Matthew 7. Yes. He says, because it's one thing to hear what I'm saying, yes. but it's another thing to hear what other people are saying too. Amen. Yeah. But when you hear me and, and the Holy Spirit gives vent to you that yes. what I'm saying is true, yes. you go and do it. Yes. Well, y'all, if that's the same thing tonight, yes. mm -hmm. while we're saying hupo akuo, yes. same thing, mm -hmm. hear and obey. Don't allow this week. To be just an a, 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 a emotional experience. Yeah. But let it transform your life mm -hmm. so that you can begin to be the change that you want to see. It begins in you. Yes. It begins in me. A quick testimony. I got a call from Doris McMillan, one of the students that were with us on, Monday, on Tuesday night. And she said, make sure you share this with the class, Sybil. So she said she went to the store to buy some stuff and had about $20 worth of stuff in her buggy. <laughs> and she started remembering the teachings from the class. Am I asking myself, is this a want or is this a need? Oh, right. And so all of the wants, I took them out of my buggy and I put them back on the shelf. But not only did she just put them back on the shelf, she said I left from there and I went to my bank. And the money that I would have spent on those items, I put it in my savings account. Right. I said to God be the glory. Amen. This teaching, y'all, is life transforming. It changes our behaviors, but only if you let it. We got to let it. I, uh, on our sheet, I, did, I gave some financial definitions, and I wanted to just quickly go back. Uh, as we had our conversation last night, I said something to Alethea, and I, I, I want to... I want to clarify on what I said when we were talking about the mutual funds. And I'll tell you why I said what I said about mutual funds. What I said was mutual funds are like taking, a, a, um, taking your money and putting it in a bag that has holes in it. Or you're putting it into a bag that's full of, uh, it's, it's a cloth bag that can't hold water. So you're putting it in. The reason I said that is if y'all have the, the financial definitions, the mutual fund, a variety of stocks, bonds, or securities grouped together, managed by a professional investment company, and purchased by individual investors through shares. The shares possess no direct ownership value in the various companies. So the reason I said that is because with the mutual funds, what you do is you buy a name. That name can be Fidelity or it can be any other name. What happens with that is there's a pool of stock or securities in that you don't get to choose. Mm -hmm. So say for instance you are a person that's against abortion, but if you're buying into a mutual fund, you don't know if that company that support abortion is included in that mutual fund. As a matter of fact, you don't get to choose. Mm -hmm. It's in the pool. And so you're buying the whole pool. If you are against, um, you know, um, um, what do you call it, um, animal killing. You know, you, you believe in animal rights and you're against that. If you're buying into mutual funds, you don't get a say on what you do or what you don't want. It's all in that pool. That's why I say mutual funds I'm not the biggest fan of. What I am the biggest fan of is what I can make a decision on myself. So that's why it was so important to me to let y'all know even though mutual funds are a more of a safety net, it's a little less risky than stocks, but it, you don't have much of a say once you buy that, that fund itself. You're in it. Of course, you can get out of it, but you're going to surrender. You're going to have a penalty to surrender it early. So be cautious when you're buying mutual funds. And what I will do, for those of you that um, do email me, I will send you a list of what I call safe mutual funds that I do want you to take a look at. But when I say that, I, what I'm going to leave y'all up to do is in me sharing that fund with you, your homework for that is to research it so that it gives you a breakdown on all of the companies that are included in that fund. And they could be anywhere from 10 to 1,000. So just do your research and know, because there could be some things that you are against, but it's included in that fund that you don't want to patronize and you don't want to invest your money on. Could be a lot of money involved, 
But what, what, what does it profit a man right. to gain the world and lose his soul if you go against what you believe? Okay? So I want you to think about that. All right, lesson number three. Let's look at what Kiyosaki says. He says, mind your own what? Mind your own business. The rich focus on their asset columns while everyone else focuses on their income statements. Ray Kroc, y'all know that name? Yeah, who is Ray Kroc? Yeah, he's, he's the um, CEO of McDonald's, yeah. He spoke to an MBA class of 1994 at the University of Texas at Austin and was later asked by a group of students, what business are you in? So many thought that he was in the wet business. When you think about McDonald's, what comes to your mind? What do you think you're in? Hamburger. 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 So many thought that he was in the hamburger, french fry business, the Coke and the tea business, because yes. now you can buy the sodas for what? For a large size, for a dollar. So everybody's thinking that he's in this business. But you know what the bombshell came? Is when he said, I'm really not in the hamburger business. He says, what I am is, is in the real estate business. What I do is I'm very strategic and looking at land to buy so that I can plant franchises. I'm making sure that once my franchise go there, there are people that will patronize me because I'm gonna use that money that I just sold that franchise for and I'm gonna buy more land somewhere else so that I can do the same thing. But there are many places that he won't go, but there are many places that he will because he knows that there's going to be money to be made in those areas. <coughs> if you look at, uh, I mean, look at any major city. If Even think about it for just a minute. If we look at downtown Birmingham, we're on the south side. Our church is 23rd Street Baptist South, Missionary Baptist South. We are in a rare, really busy area, but how many McDonald's do you see in our area? Two. You got one that's down by UAB. And it's yeah. one by St. Vincent. And then one by St. Vincent. Yeah. So we got two in that area. But then if you were to go to Roebuck, how many do you see on that strip, just that strip alone? Is it two? It's, it's two. Yeah. yeah. Another busy area. You're like, is Roebuck larger than the south side downtown area of Birmingham? It's not. That's a larger area, but because they know that people aren't going to patronize it as well, he knows that there's more money to be made by building that, that, that business somewhere else and making sure the money comes back in. And so, y'all, we have to be just as strategic in our planning. So, again, his business is not the hamburger business, but his business is to sell hamburger franchises. His most significant factors that he used was the location. The person who bought the franchise was also buying the real estate mm -hmm. under the franchise. Today, McDonald's is the largest single owner of real estate in the world, even more so than the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all have ever looked at Catholic churches and the size of Catholic churches throughout America. Just America, not all over the world, but just America. They're always going to be large. But the real estate that he purchases, it outnumbers the Catholic Church. McDonald's owns some of the most valuable intersections, street corners in America and around the globe. What is your business? That's an important question for us. Many have confused their profession with their business. Their profession may be a banker, a bailiff, a mechanic, an attorney, a chef, a secretary, a store manager. When we forget to mind our business, we spend our lives minding someone else's business. And what do we do? Make them rich. We make them rich. How many of you, how many of you are still working? By show of hands. Show of hands. Do you work at, at least eight hours a day? Are you working your own, your, doing your own business? Is, are you owning your own business? I'm not even talking about self-employed either. Because we're working that many hours a day, when you get off of work, how do you feel? 
Some are tired. <laughs> Do I hear somebody that says truly energetic? <laughs> For a few minutes as, as I'm walking out the door. <laughs> so, so, it's a relief. It only lasts about 15 minutes after that. I'm sorry. Yeah. So by the time we leave, we're so tired. We can't invest in our own business. We don't have the energy. And sometimes you're right. We may not have all of the money. But that's the one thing I shared last night. We think it takes thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to start our own business. I'm here tonight to tell you no, it does not. What it does take is the first tool that we used on Monday night, and that's what? D, I, yes, discipline. It takes discipline. Discipline to say no to this, no to that. Discipline to say, I don't need that, I only want it. But I want this more, therefore I'm gonna make the sacrifice so it does, it takes discipline. So to become financially secure, a person needs to mind their own business. Your business revolves around your asset column and not your income column. You must know the difference between an asset and a liability, and you must buy assets. So Kiyosaki's philosophy is the middle class, well, he says this, it's, it's possible to move from middle class to rich by spending less on what he describes as doodads, clothes, cars, televisions, and instead by income producing assets. And over time, there's this strategy will result in a growing passive income that comes to generate more cash flow than the paycheck. So businesses that don't require you being present, what are some of them? Did, um, did I put those in your, in your package? Yes. So businesses that don't require your presence. Let's throw out some of those. Anything that has value produces income or appreciates and has it has a it has a read market. Y'all anything that is valuable, it typically is gonna have a it's going to have a, a label on it that's going to give you very specific instructions. And they probably will be long. And most of us don't like long readings. So we have to be cautious with that. Um, and I, I wanted to share those just so that you can have them. Yes, ma'am. I just, I was thinking about something how you talked about before. You talked about the income. Yes. And, I, and this is just from my perspective, but I feel because you have bills and you have income, income being more liquid. Whereas these assets here, they're not quite as easily accessible. So therefore, it's easier to keep them, I'm thinking, if you choose to go that route. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I, want, I want to emphasize on that. You're exactly right. Typically, with income, it, it's going to come in the form of a check. Um, salary income, I'll say it like that, salary. It's going to come in the form of a check or direct deposit or a pay card or something like that. Mm -hmm. And usually, you can go and spend. You can go and pay your debt. You can go and make purchases. But you're right. When it comes to these assets, such as real estate, stocks, bonds, notes, those mutual funds, y'all, they're not easy to get to, to cash them in. You go through a whole rink of, of different things trying to cash them in. And it is. It's good because it makes you determine, is it something that I really need to do right now? Right. Or do I have another source that I can go to without liquidating these assets? Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. That's so very important that we don't get it. And that's why I told y'all last night, when you invest in the market, you want it to be for long term. You don't want to get in the market and two years, one year, you're selling everything. You have not made a profit. You want to wait because your money, number one, is already going to be fluctuating up and down when you're in the market. But be careful. Don't rush to get out of it too fast. Watch it. But what did I say last night? Not too, too much. Not too much. Too much. Too much. Because you can easily, yeah, do checks on it. You want to make sure nothing has happened. Um, we were talking about that, and you were saying get an app and check on it. Um, I have an app on my phone. Yes. Called Robin Hood. That a friend of mine invited me to, and I actually own a stock in 
they give you a free stock. They choose, like you pick one of three, but it's not, you know, like a stock you would know. Well, it is. I think one of them is Apple, Sprint, or something yeah. like that. They entice you, of course, to get in. Yeah. But you do get a stock when you sign up, and like you said, you can transfer money to it and kind of check it and watch it, you know, over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So if y'all wanted the app, I can, you know, send you the link or whatever so you can download it. I just need your number, but it's okay. hopefully something I could use. Okay, you know, that's very good. Like you said, it's long term, good. exactly, to kind of watch it and see. When you're talking about Walmart, yeah. and Dollar General, the places that you already spend your money at, it just it makes too much sense. Yeah, you know, like I'm already giving you that. I can at least get try to get something back. Yeah, and and really, you know, I don't use it as often because I, you know people are are pretty nice, pretty simple. But you can use it as a leverage if you run it. If say, for instance, if you're in Walmart and the cashier is just nasty, remind that cashier, I'm, I'm a stockholder. Stock mm -hmm. The company you work for. Yeah, that's important because if they know that you're a stockholder, they know that you can get in contact with upper management, and they're not going to tolerate such behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. Chick Fil A. Companies that you patronize, what I need y'all to do, this is this is a quick homework assignment for one week. And many of you may, and, and somebody may have to do this for two weeks or a month because you may not buy out often. But I need you to just um, start writing down the places that you go to number one, eat or grocery shop at. Once you look at those places, I need you to look up, look up those stocks, or even text me. If, if you don't have a computer, call me, it's okay. Say, hey, listen, Sybil, this is my list. I went here this week. Can you pull up this stock and tell me how much, what's the price of this stock? Because the more you start seeing, the more that you're making them billionaires, the more you want to get a piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. That's so important for us. If you're patronizing a place three and four and five times a week, why are you not owning <coughs> shares of that stock? So I've got a question. All right, I've, I've gotten to the age where I can withdraw from my 401k without being penalized. Mm -hmm. But we have an investment company that's, that's managing my portfolio. Yeah. So I need to be a little bit more active in understand. yes, yeah. understanding yes. what's going on. So I, so you can have yeah. Yes. Yeah. Please, do you get a statement? Yeah. Okay, if, if you'll let me take a look at that statement, uh, I, and I tell everybody, even in the industry that I'm in, I am not an investment counselor. Right. All the information that I'm sharing with you tonight is based on experience, based on my research, based on my understanding of the finance, of, of, of the finance industry. And so I always have, and I see it, what we call an investment counselor, to take a look at it with me. Not to make any strategy changes, but just to help me to make sure what is in is right for you. Because when, uh, when when we first started, I'm just a conservative kind of person. Yes. <laughs> and you know, but what I'm saying, but it, it could be to my detriment. Yeah. You know, so that's what I'm saying. I, I don't know what I'm looking at, so I, I I'm not making wise choices. I know I'm not. Okay. But they're doing it for me. But again, my money is paying them. Right. Okay. Because right. Ameriprise is our broker. Ameriprise. Yes. Yes. An another one, which is good. You know, I do like Ameriprise. And they have been really good to make sure um, the investors are doing well. So I, I would like to take a look at that, okay. if you can get a copy of your statement. Okay. Any other comments? One more comment. Um, you, know, you mentioned retirement fund. We call ours a thrift savings plan. And that's why I'm so cautious when it comes to certain things, because be it 08 or whatever, when the crash happened, yeah. I was dealing with common stock. But if you see more than fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 go away, yeah. That changed my mind real quick, so I went to the G and have most of um, that in like a G fund, but you still have an option, and I do Roth, and I do the G, but um, I know I can go back to the common stock, Yeah. but I'm just real hesitant. Now, listen, there are some aggressive stock purchasers, there are some um, conservative, and there are some who don't mind uh, playing it totally safe. And that's okay. I can't tell you, you, I can't tell any of you uh, how to invest your money because only you know what you've been through. 
and you have to be cautious and careful enough to know what, what, you, what risk you're willing to take. All of these are risk. You gotta have in mind, if I don't take a risk, I risk not to, you know, not to, um, not to profit, not to gain. I risk to be stingy. Yeah. yeah. So you risk to just sit and stay. And so I do say, I believe don't in diversification. Quit. Yeah, but, but. It, 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 for for your sake, mm -hmm. for conservative, for safe, stocks are not the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say my talk, my conversation with y'all this week has been for stocks to invest in stocks on a personal level. Mm -hmm. With those, you're able to pick and choose what stocks you want to buy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think I asked when, when we, on, on last night there was a question that I asked, right? The first thing I wanted to know is, um, before you go into buying stock, well, the second second one is, do you have any credit card debt? Mm -hmm. That was the second part. But the first one is dealing with the fact that, depending on where you are comfortably, mm -hmm. stocks may not be the option for you. Mm -hmm. If you don't have enough money to spare, $20, $30 out of every paycheck, if you don't have it to spare, don't get into the market. Because if you find yourself not having 20 and $30 to spare out of every month, you're gonna need that before you start investing well. Mm -hmm. And so this has to be money that you can put away for three to five years, remember, and not really worry about needing it right away because it's not gonna grow. That, not, I can't say all the time because there are some stocks that will grow quickly, but not all of them, okay? So great questions. Any more comments? Any more questions? You start saving the money and you get it. I have to get saved up and then have to find out how much the stock is with me. Save it up and bang. That's it. <laughs> and, and again, thank you for sharing that, Ms. Beverly. It's important to save. It's important. Saving, remember, when we talk about the saving aspect of it, Saving is what we call that emergency fund, mm -hmm. right? And the emergency fund can be put aside for anything. It could be three months, six months worth of income so that you can have it. Because every time you run into an emergency, you don't want to have to pay a penalty. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have to pay to get your money out. So keep a savings account mm -hmm. so that you can have some liquid cash in there. All right? Five reasons. I just want to share that this part with us, five reasons why many of our people are still broke. And I'm not gonna break them down all the way, but I do wanna say, number one, we spend more money than we make. <laughs> number two, we don't support black businesses. Number three, we don't save our money. Beverly, you just got finished saying that. Put it aside and save it. Number four, we don't know how to invest. We're afraid of it. We're scared of losing. When for 20 and 30 years, that's all we've done is we've lost. And so what, why do we still fear? Because it's the unknown. But guess how it becomes, uh, how do we become better knowledgeable of the unknown? Yes. It's about research and becoming more educated. The last one is that people are not working towards getting out of poverty. Y'all, you know, many of our people love it. Yes. It feels like they're thriving. Yeah. That's so sad. It feels like it's normal. I'm sad. If, 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 any, if any one of us lived in those type of positions and we lived with people that had the same mindset, it's hard for us to get out of it because we feel like we betrayed our own community. And they feel like we betrayed them. But guess what, y'all? Somebody has to make the difference. I've heard so many of the rappers that have gotten out and you know they got their game on, and now those that grew up in the neighborhoods with them, oh yeah, that's my boy. I knew him then. You know, they're lifted up. And it's okay because in the beginning, it does seem like you're a sellout, you're a traitor. You left, you went on got your thing going on, you know. But for those who don't, more than likely they won't. For us, we gotta, ha we gotta have a totally different mindset. 
The gap in wealth and income between blacks and whites are stark. They have not narrowed significantly in 50 years. Disparities between whites and blacks, there are some notable differences in how each group approach their money. Just a few. The wealthiest 5% of black Americans are slightly less likely to hold what? Such as? Why, 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 do, why do we think that? Why do we know that? Because people don't say that. And, and we're afraid. Right. We're afraid of taking that risk. Can't of the financial. You, don't have. you can't. That's exactly right. So, of the financial assets they do invest in, wealthy blacks are more likely than wealthy whites to invest in safer mm -hmm. assets, preferring CDs, savings bonds, life insurance to higher risk, um, uh, to, to such higher risk assets. Wealthy black Americans have more money in real estate holdings than equally wealthy white. The former hold 41% of their non-financial assets in real estate, while the figure of the latter is just about 22%. Wealthy black Americans are less likely to hold equity in business assets. Looking at this group's non-financial assets, 9% are equity in business assets. Yo, know, there is such a disparity. We don't patronize each other enough, and we wonder why we don't have more good businesses in our communities. Sometimes I can ride a strip, and I can see four, five, six payday loan, mm -hmm. cash advance stores in our communities. I'm gonna tell this quick story, and I've shared it once before. I was in a different position at the bank, and I was hiring employees to come and work um, in the branches. And I had this young lady who came in, and I was interviewing her. And I remember asking her where she was at, and she was at a credit union in Inslee. She says, but we don't do much over there because um, they don't have the mind to want to do better. So we don't really want to fix the place up and do well for them. Nonetheless, she was not hired because my mindset was, if you can't see potential in the people that you're servicing, I can't see potential in hiring someone to work under my leadership when I look just like the people that you've been serving all these years. I had a problem with that. And it's difficult for me because, y'all, anytime we see young black people, older black adults in our community that don't have the financial knowledge that we have, our responsibility is to educate them. We have a responsibility one to another because if I'm down, guess what, y'all? You're down. If I'm up, my responsibility is to bring you up with me. And that's why I said on the first night, if people keep coming to you, borrowing money from you because they think you are their bank, you become their bank by charging them what the bank charges them, charge them interest. Now, the one caveat in that is when there's a person that's really in need, that is a person you don't charge interest to. The Bible does talk about that. But that person that's giving the same income, probably more income, more um, uh, social services than you are, charge them interest because you got to begin the, the teaching process and letting them know it's not okay to be frivolous and trivial in your spending. It's not okay. God's called me to be a good steward of what he's given me, and I'm not gonna let you turn me away from doing what God's told me to do. So my responsibility is to charge you. So brother, sister, come right on. Because the more interest I charge you, the more I can give to the kingdom. We got work to do. And because of the work that we got to do, what you're doing is helping me do it better. So come right on. Something that I wanted to share with us. In our community, we're learning that we have a new president. I don't know if we knew that always. But we've learned that we have a new president. I know some of you are saying something different, but I'm not hearing all that. Because the reality <laughs> is, he's president of the United States. Amen. There's something that he has proposed to the black community. And it's called President Trump's New Deal for Black America. Mm -hmm. There were 10 things that the president has proposed 
that he's going to help black America out with. So with the plan for urban renewal, nobody needs to tell African Americans in this country that the old New Deal from the Democratic Party is not working for them. In election after election, Democratic Party leaders take African American voters for granted. And year after year, the condition of black America, it gets worse. The conditions in our inner cities today are unacceptable. Too many black Americans have been left behind. The following are 10 promises announced by President Trump in 2016 when he was in Charlotte, North Carolina. Number one, greater education through what? School choices. School choices. What does that look like today, y'all? Yeah, more charter schools. Yeah, what else? We got uh, tuition prices are beginning to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, you're looking at the funding for the historically black colleges and universities. They're pouring more money into our colleges. And so he is fulfilling. He's, 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 he's told us a truth that is really beginning to work. And y'all, we have, our pastor has said, where he's at right now, don't see it as a negative but make sure you begin to partner so that you can understand the system that we're under and you begin to work the system. That's important for us. The second thing um, his, his proposal is, is safe communities. We will make our communities safe again. He says the reduction of crime is not merely a goal, but it is a necessity. How many of us know that it's necessary? Yeah. yeah. And, and if, if our children are to grow up, it's a necessity for our communities to be safer. Otherwise, y'all, we're losing our children by the dozen every day. There are so many shootings and our young children are dying. Third, equal justice under the law. Since we will apply the law fairly, equally, and without prejudice, there will be only one set of rules, um, not a two-tiered system of justice. Equal justice also means the same rules for Wall Street. Yeah, no um, uh, rich community and poor community, but equal justice under the law for every community. The fourth one, tax reforms to create jobs and lift up people and communities. What does that look like today? The tax cut, so in 2018, that's a huge deal. The tax cut, the tax reform bill that was passed, that is huge. So you won't have to itemize. You, everybody pretty much that's under a, a certain income will have a standard deduction, which is going to be better because a lot of us don't have twenty-two dollars or $24,000 to itemize. And so with the standard, de, um, standard um, deduction, you don't even, uh, itemization, you don't even have to worry about it. It's going to be really good for some, not for everybody, but it is, uh, even with businesses, the tax cut for businesses is supposed to create more jobs. And that was the fifth thing. Financial reform to expand credit to support new jobs, job creation. Six, trade that works for American workers. How is that looking? Good. So we're, again, y'all, these are some changes that we're beginning to see right away. Uh, protection from illegal immigration. The DACA program, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's like huge on that one. So we'll, we'll skip that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that affects so that many of the workers yeah. right. that have come and done the work because many of our people have said it's too hot. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's too dirty. Mm -hmm. Take too long. Right. You ain't going to pay me enough. Right. You're not going to pay me enough. Mm -hmm. Whereas when the Hispanics come in, they're saying, I got a family to feed. Yes. I got a wife to take care of. How, how soon do you want it done? Ma'am, how, how was my service to you today? Did I take care of everything you need? Those questions are asked because they're letting us know, I want your business. But really what they're saying is, I want your money. Mm -hmm. And it's okay because we're willing to pay our money to a person that provides good service. That's important. New infrastructure investments. Protect the African American church. We will protect religious liberty, promote strong families, and support the African American church. The last one is America First Foreign Policy. 
Stop trying to build democracies overseas, wasting trillions of dollars, but focus on defeating terrorists and putting America first. That's been the thing that President Trump has been very, uh, yeah, he's extremely adamant that this is what I want to do so that the U.S. will know that I'm serious about the role that I'm taking. Yeah. <laughs> any questions, any comments as we wrap it up? All right. One last thing I want to give everybody. We've talked about it just a little bit, but I wanted to give everybody a budget sheet. I want everyone to have an opportunity to start writing a budget. How many of you already do that? 